Hello, and welcome to the White Rocket Podcast, brought to you by White Rocket Entertainment, in association with people like you, our great supporters via Patreon.com. I'm Van Allen Plexico, and this episode, which is, again, one long conversation with a variety of guests about the best of popular culture, don't want to forget that part, of course, this episode I'm going alone because I'm doing a sort of a audio recording slash live video recording at the same time to talk about the second Chronicles of Amber, Merlin's books, the five, the second cycle, the Merlin cycle of Roger Zelazny's Amber novels. Now, um, we've, uh, we've done shows in the past talking about the Corwin books. I've also posted quite a few panels audio from panels that I've been on at Dragon Con and other conventions around the country, especially a couple of years ago during the, uh, the anniversary of Roger Zelazny's uh, passing. And so we've talked about the Corum books a great bit, but I haven't really talked much about the Merlin books. So what made me want to talk about that now? Well, a couple of years ago, I started rereading the entire series of 10 books, as I do occasionally. Um, but in the past, I've only read the Corwin books for the most part and stopped. Uh, I've, I've read the Corwin five books a million times, and I've listened to his reading of them. I've listened to Alessandro Giuli- uh, Giuliani's readings of them. So I, am, you know, I, I could practically recite <laughs> the Corwin novels off the top of my head. I've read them so many times and listened to them. But I, it dawned on me, I read the Merlin books as they were coming out, as the science fiction book club was um, releasing them in hardcovers back in the late 80s, I believe, early 90s. I think from around 86 to early mid, you know, 91, something like that. Uh, and then I went back and read them again about 2003, maybe. And that was the first time I had reread them. And so... Um, I thought it was darn high time to read them for a third time through. And, um, and I couldn't remember a lot about them. It's weird. I mean, having read them twice before, you'd think they would stand out pretty vividly. And some parts do. I think that, I think that a lot of the first book, Trumps of Doom, is very vivid and stands out. Partly because it's new, right? We were used to Corwin. Suddenly we had a whole new narrator for the only time other than that one chapter in, I think, Sign of the Unicorn that random narrates it. Uh, which threw me for a loop back then. Um, so it was a new thing. But then by the time you get to maybe the third book, it, it, it starts to be a little bit of a, of a task to get through them. because, And that's what I want to talk about today a little bit, is just sort of my reaction to reading those books again for the first time in, in quite a few years. And now I have to say, too, that it's taken me a couple of years to get through them. I blew through the... I blew through the uh, the Corwin five books, probably just in a space of a few months. I think in 2015, and I started reading the Merlin books again in 2016. And it's taken me from 2016 to now to get through them in sort of three spurts. Okay, because I kept bogging down, and that's one of the things I want to talk about. I love them, and like I said, in fact, I can't remember any books I've ever been more anxiously awaiting. You know, in other words, uh, any books that I was more excited when they came in the mail from the book club or anywhere, you know, than when those Merlin books would come in. I was so excited when a new Amber book would come. Oh, it was so great. Um, and reading them through the first time, I thought they were wonderful. I loved them. And then, um, you know, a few years later, I start seeing people talking about them on the internet and stuff. And, you know, people are saying that they aren't as good, that they don't hold up as well as Corwin. I was thinking, well, I don't remember that the Merlin books were any worse than the Corwin books. That surprises me. I, you know, and so I read them through the second time around 2003. And I remember thinking, well, they're not quite up to this, you know, they're, they're not quite the read, you know, they don't quite have quite the oomph, quite the, the narrative force propelling them along that the Corum books do, but they're still great. Reading them through this time, the third time, the, the, the problems start to magnify, okay? 
So we're going to talk a little bit about what makes them great, and we're going to talk a little bit about what makes them not quite as good as the Corwin books, but while still wonderful, right? Because, I mean, it's Amber and it's Zelazny, so how bad could it really be, you know? Okay, so here are, now, like I said, originally I had the hardcovers of all five that came from the sci-fi, the science, the SF book, I think it was just the SF or Science Fiction Book Club. I had originally, for those that don't know, I had originally discovered Amber um, when the Science Fiction Book Club back in the early 80s used to run an ad in magazines like Starlog or Omni or whatever. They would run these ads and they would always say, you know, kind of like with Columbia House music back then, some of you know what I'm talking about there, where, you know, with Columbia House they would say, pick seven albums for a penny and then you only have to buy four more in the next year. Well, similarly, um, the Science Fiction Book Club would say, you know, pick four or five books uh, for a penny and you have to buy like four or five more books in the next two years. And they send you a catalog every month to pick what you want and don't want. And they'll send you a book if you don't tell them not to, which was always kind of funny. Um, so a friend of mine in high school, when I was probably in ninth grade, told me about Nine Princes in Amber and said, oh, this is a really cool book. There's this whole bit at the beginning where he doesn't know who he is, but he's He's fooling his relative into thinking that he does, and it's you know he's pretending, and it's really neat. And I thought, oh, well, that sounds cool. That's a nice hook, right? So that Nine Princes and Amber book has a great opening hook, which is Corwin has amnesia. And see, that, that does several things. One, it makes it really interesting from the very beginning what's going on. Uh, because you don't know you don't know what's happened to him because he doesn't know what happened to him. And that's important for a first person narrative because in a first person narrative, for the most part, you know what the main character knows, and you don't know anything the main character doesn't know. So when Corwin would encounter stuff he recognized, he'd tell you about it, and you'd learn about it as the reader. But when Corwin would encounter stuff, when Corwin would encounter stuff that he didn't know about, you didn't know what it was either, and so there was that perpetuating mystery until he would solve it, and he would figure it out, and then you would learn, right? So it was a great it was a great stylistic narrative choice by Zelazny to have his main character be not only an unreliable narrator, as they say, but also a, um, an amnesiac. And so you learn as he learns. Okay, so that's how I found out about it. And so what I did was I joined the Science Fiction Book Club. And again, what they would do is they would say, you know, you pick five from our little ad, but everybody got one of these two. You either got Dragon Riders of Pern by Anne McCaffrey, or you got the two-volume Chronicles of Amber by Roger Zelazny. There are a lot of people in the country today, I think, that, that are fans of Roger Zelazny because they got that Chronicles of Amber with that Boris Vallejo cover of, of Corwin, I guess. He's in, like, red and blue, but it doesn't make sense. But he got the sword, you know with the fighting the two cat monsters, cat demon creatures. So there's a lot of people that discovered, and, th and that's how I got into them. Then I went to my local library, and for some reason my local library in little small town Alabama had a whole bunch of Zelazny books. Had To Die in Ittlebar, and um, quite a uh, Doorways in the Sand, quite a few. You'd think they'd have Lord of Light. I don't think they had Lord of Light. I ended up buying that one, but they had quite a few. Uh, creatures of Light and Darkness, and on and on. So... So I was a, you know, most people that know me know that I'm a Roger Zelazny fan almost ahead of everything else. That's like almost my number one fandom, I think, number one thing. And it inspired and, and influences everything I write in books like Lucian, Dark God's Homecoming, Baranak, Storming the Gates, and the upcoming Caroline, Heart Cold as Ice. Uh, so go to Amazon and look me up and you'll see those books. And if you like Roger Zelazny, check those out. Um, so I had the hardcovers from the book club. But for those of you watching on the video feed, I'll make this quick for those of you that aren't. I'm just going to show the books. Here are the copies I have now. I have the Great Book of Amber. It's somewhere back, big and heavy, and I'm not going to drag it out. Then I have the little, the little trade paperback. So there's Trumps of Doom. And I would argue that Zelazny's cover art never has anything to do, really, with what's going on. There's Blood of Amber in the paperback edition. And then Sign of Chaos. And my wife, by the way, got me a hardcover of Sign of Chaos that was signed by Zelazny. How cool of a Christmas present was that? And then here, just this past year, here's uh, Night of Shadows. This is the one that hung me up a bunch. And then I just yesterday finished reading for the third time Prince of Chaos, the final, what do they say on the cover? The triumphant conclusion of the Amber novels. A um, few things about it. Let me kind of work my way backwards because that's what's, uh, Prince of Chaos is what's on my mind obviously right now the most. 
Um, the problem I had, I ended up actually buying Will Wheaton's narration, his audio, his audible audio book of Prince of Chaos, because um, um, I got so bogged down reading it that I thought I need to just have somebody reading it to me to just keep it going so I don't slow down, right? I can just listen. And it worked. I, I, I managed to get through the end of Night of Shadows, book four, and then I got Prince of Chaos on Audible, and I kind of alternated between reading the, the paperback uh, and, and listening to the audio. And the reason for that is, let's kind of compare, okay, and you'll see what I mean. Let's compare the Corwin books to the Merlin books. Well, the reason that, that Prince of Chaos and Night of Shadows before it slowed me down, there's just a whole lot of conversations and political machination, machinations going on and reiterations of what the situation is and recapitulations of what the situation is and now who's doing what and this is doing what with who, with why, and this is why and where. There's a lot of that in the Corwin books, to be fair. There's a lot of it, but there's a lot of it in the Merlin books. You know, the, the early Merlin books have vivid action scenes where he goes and has clever clever diet um, repartee with a demon or something or he fights a monster or something it's in there honestly by the fourth and fifth book there's not a lot of monsters there's not a lot of creatures there's not a lot of battles uh, by the fourth and especially the first half of the fifth book it really turns into politics the and, and particularly the politics of the courts of chaos not even of amber now I, I think that Part of the problem in the way that these books don't quite measure up to the Corwin books is with the Corwin books, there was always this sense of people are out to kill Corwin, and if he slows down for a minute, he's dead. You know, he, There's always this sense of momentum with the Corwin books that he has to go, 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 keep going forward, don't slow down, because if he does, the people that are out to get him are going to get him. Uh, with Merlin, you have a little bit of that early on, but honestly, later on, Merlin's just kind of, he's like, oh, I'm going to go see Mandor, and we'll have a conversation about this. I'll see Fiona, and we'll have a conversation. You know, I'll look for my mother, and we'll talk to her, have a conversation. Oh, here's this snake that I played with as a child. We'll have a conversation. You know, oh, here's Luke. We'll have a conversation. There's just a lot of conversations in those Late in the last two Merlin books, it really kind of devolves down into Merlin's politics in the courts of chaos and conversations. Also, I think that one of the things that makes the Corwin books so great is that while Zelazny sketches and, and illustrates the um, metaphorically the brothers and sisters so well, and you you, know, you like most of them. Um, it's always clear that they could betray one another and stab one another in the back at the drop of a hat. There's always this sense that Corwin is in mortal danger from any of his relatives, pretty much. That may be random. <laughs> but other than that, you know, you never know what any of them are going to do. There's always this sense of, oh, no, you know, Corwin has to watch out because his relatives are all ready to kill him at any moment because they all want to be king or queen. In the Merlin books, the, everybody in Amber gets along fine. Right, Random is king, Vial is queen, Julian's cool, and 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 I mean you know Gerard. Every everybody's getting along fine, and um, in fact, even if there was that still that tension over Corwin, Corwin is nowhere to be seen, which is disappointing. But it also means that that whole you know maybe some payback for the stuff that Corwin did to in his in his books. That never happens because Corwin is, is never on the scene until close to the end. And um, everybody likes Merlin. Everybody gets along with Merlin. It's good in a way because you don't have all that wrought up melodrama, you know, or are they going to. St There's never a sense in these books that anybody in Amber is going to suddenly stab Merlin in the back, right? With Corwin. He was afraid Cain was going to betray him. He was, going to he was afraid Gerard was going to betray him. He was worried about what Benedict was going to think or do. He was worried about all of them, I mean, not to mention Eric, of course. Um, even, you know, even with Blaze, he was kind of like, we're teamed up, but yet, I don't know if 
I totally trust you. I don't know. You know, there's always that sense. Whereas in this, everybody likes Merlin. So in a way, it's kind of nice, right? Reading the first couple of Merlin books, you're kind of like, oh, for once everybody gets along. Oh, this is nice. Everybody likes Merlin. Nobody's out to kill him. It's all, you know, it's all going to be fine. But then after a while, you realize you need some tension here. The only tension you really have is between Merlin and Luke. And even they kind of, you know, Luke is so likable, even as kind of the sort of bad guy early on that, you know, he's, he's, he's not Eric. He's not the villain, you know. He's, he's, you know they're going to team up. You know they're going to fight and then team up. They were buddies before. They briefly kind of, you know, as things get revealed, skirmish a little bit. And then they, they team up for the whole rest of the series. So even Luke is not um, a big threat to Merlin. Um, there's Mask, but we hardly ever know anything about her. There's Jazra, but, yeah, you know, very, very rarely. There's just... In other words, the Corwin books had a unified, cohesive storyline that started here and went to here and barely let up a breath the whole way through. And it was always about Corwin beating his relatives, beating chaos, and becoming king. That was all it was about till the very end. With Merlin, what are those books about? Well, they're fi- you know finding out who's been trying to kill him. He finds that out very quickly. Are they about who's the who's who's possessing these different people that are following him around? You kind of find that out more or less, you know, eventually. Is it about the is it about the politics and chaos? You don't even find that's find out that's going on until like book four or book five. And in fact, any sense of Merlin becoming king doesn't even come up until well into the fifth book. Um, it's not about politics in amber there's a whole business about kashva and begma and everything but that's who cares i mean you know to uh, to an alarming degree a lot of the merlin books turn into sort of like the backstory of star wars episode one the phantom menace where it's about trade deals and ambassadors and visiting other planets and worlds and stuff and that's all well and good, but it's certainly nothing like Corwin running for his life, being chased by every brother and sister, and you know trying to get his memories back, and fighting the, you know Benedict on the Black Road and all that. So, and and traveling on horseback through the courts of through the everything he took him to the courts of chaos where he met Merlin. So I mean seriously, again I ask the question. It's a fair question. What are Merlin book Merlin's books about? I mean ultimately they're about him becoming king of chaos. But even that is something that only really even looks like a possibility halfway or two-thirds of the way through the last book. So what was all that other business about? It's, it's, and, and, and let me make another comparison. With the Corwin books, you get the sense that Zelazny started out making it about Corwin having amnesia and wanting to fight his brothers to be king. But honestly, you know, Eric is dead by the time of the third book. And Corwin is pretty much on his way to being king if he wants it by sign of, by the sign of the unicorn, by book three. It takes him longer to sort everything out, but I mean at that point it's pretty much his to his to lose, you know. Um but then it but and it, but you get the sense that about halfway through there, Zelazny shifts gears a little bit, and now it becomes about the Black Road and the Courts of Chaos and the Pattern Fall War and all that. But that's still just two stories, right? There's the Corwin with amnesia trying to be king, dealing with his relatives, and then there's the Black Road and um, and the Courts of Chaos stuff, and that's pretty much it. Everything else that happens in the Corwin books really is a tributary directly to those two major storylines over five books. Now, with the Merlin books, I get the sense, and maybe you you don't, and maybe you feel differently about it, and that's fine, and I'd love to hear about hear, hear your thoughts. Um, but with the Merlin books, I always got the sense that Roger changed gears multiple times, right? It was going to be about this, and he kind of ran out of that story, so then he makes it more about this, but then he kind of runs out of that, you know, steam for that story, and then he makes it more about this. So the so the Merlin books are about about Merlin on Earth, on the Shadow Earth, try, people trying to assassinate him every year, and then it's about getting to know Luke and finding out who he is and who the Taiga is, right? 
But and then it's about where's where's Corwin? Don't know. Has nothing to do with anything else as far as we know. Um, it's about the keep of the four worlds and Jazra and the wizard and oh then there's Jurt or Yurt, however you want to pronounce it. Will Smith I mean Will Will Wheaton calls him Yurt. I've always thought of him as Jurt, so whichever way kind of like jerk. <laughs> so then it's about battling him. Uh, but then here comes Mandor, and and then it's about and Dalt and Coral and the Eye, and then it becomes about that. Well, then it goes to the court. Then there's that whole business in between Shadows and the Pattern Ghosts. And by the way, the Pattern Ghosts are really cool. More about that in a second. And then it ends up in the Courts of Chaos, and it's about finding Corwin, and it's about will he be king, and it's about the Spikered and all that. So, I just feel like the fifth books, the the the, the second five books, the Merlin books. They're about a whole lot of little things, a couple of medium-sized things, and, and, there's, and, and there's certainly about a couple of things that in the Amber universe are very big, but in terms of a story that we're reading, not that big. You know, I mean, honestly, at the end, you know, when Merlin becomes, we assume, King of Chaos, because it kind of ends before any resolution, really, but when Merlin agrees to become King of Chaos, if, it, if in that scene Merlin had said, you know what, I'm going to say that Mandor can be my, my proxy, uh, and he can, or Yurt can, Jurt can be my, you know, he can, he can have it instead, would you have cared that much? I mean, in other words, if Merlin had pulled a Corwin and said, you know, I really don't want to be king, I'm going to go off and do something else, would you have put the book down and said, no, oh, that ruined the book? No, you'd have been like, oh, okay. So, so, you know, like when you're reading the Corwin books, does Corwin become king or not? i got to know. I've got to know. It's been all about that for five books. I've got to know. And when he doesn't, you're like, oh, okay, he, he had it and he turned it down, but he had good reasons. But, but he could have had it, right? And they all know he could have had it. Whereas with Merlin, if he becomes king of chaos or doesn't become king of chaos, would anybody have cared other than his mother? I mean, even Mandor was kind of like, eh, okay, right? I mean, Mandor had the spell on the spiker to make him to make him want to become king and obey them. I know, but I always got the sense that was much more Dara, right? That wasn't so much that wasn't so much Mandor. And when you know when the when the when the Logris comes in at the end and says, you know what, Merlin wins. If he wants to be king, he can do it his way, and you all got to deal with that later. And then the Logos disappears, and Dara's like, son of a... You know, Dara's furious, and Mandor actually smiles. You get the sense that Mandor was like... Mandor's attitude always struck me as, if I can control Merlin, that means Merlin is too weak to be king by himself anyway, right? So in other words, I get the sense that Mandor's opinion was... If Merlin can be controlled, that means Merlin needs to be controlled, right? But when Merlin demonstrates that he can't be controlled, then Mandor is kind of like, oh, then I guess he didn't need to be because he's able to win, right? If Merlin is able to win, then he deserves to be king and we don't need to be controlling him. That was the idea I got from Mandor. That was not remotely the idea of the impression I got from Dara. Dara's idea seemed to be, I want to control my son and make him my servant on the throne, and if I can't have that, I'm going to pitch a fit and go away. Right? There was never any sense from Dara of Merlin is better than I thought he was, he's overachieved in my eyes, I want to get to know him now and try to influence him positively, right? She, there, maybe she will later, right? Maybe there will come a time later when she sits back, takes a breath, sleeps on it a little bit, and then Dara says, you know what? My son ended up beating the pattern and the Logris. That must mean he's pretty worthy. He's a person worth knowing and worth operating with as an equal or as a, as a superior to me now, as opposed to me trying to make him my slave, which is the word that they use there, that Zelazny used. So maybe Dara will come back later and say, son, I'm sorry, I kind of got full of myself. I thought you needed controlling. You've demonstrated that you didn't need controlling, so now I'm willing to accept you as king 
and it's all good and how let me help give you advice. Let me make suggestions, right? That would be cool. There was never any sense, though, at the end of that book that Dara was ever going to do that. Mandor, yes. In fact, Mandor says to him something like, and this is all fresh on my mind because I just read the fifth book, but you know, Mandor says words to the effect of, um, if, the, you know, if the time comes that you want some honest counsel, you know where to find me. And Merlin's like, you got it. And Mandor salutes him and, and, and goes away. So we never, you know, there are the short stories, but we never got one, I don't think. I'm going to have to go back and reread them now because maybe there, maybe we did, uh, where Merlin, I want to say the short story is about Corwin and Luke. I don't remember a short story where Merlin gets to meet and treat with random as an equal. Because I think how interesting that would be to see the two of them. Because, you know, they're both not what you'd think of as a cosmic king of, a, of, of one of the poles of existence. Neither one of them, right? Random is, the, random, random is king for the main reason because he was the least likely to be king. And so that's kind of, I, I, I always got the sense that the unicorn, the unicorn picked random because random was the least likely. And had the least baggage in a lot, a lot of ways, you know, and grew up a lot during those adventures with Merlin. I mean, with with Corwin, uh, and of course Merlin is the Merlin was like fiftieth in the succession before all the craziness started happening. So, it, I just think it'd be interesting to see Merlin and Random together at a sort of a summit meeting, you know, where they have to treat each other as equals rather than random bossing Merlin around. And I want to see that because I want to see, I wanted to see them meet before random found out. I wanted to see random being like, Merlin, get your butt over here. Bah, bah, bah. And Merlin going like, you know, random, you really shouldn't talk to me that way. Oh, I shouldn't. And why is that? Because I'm the king of chaos and we're equals. And random be like, uh, what? <laughs> that would be a great scene, you know? And, and, and his wife, the owl there. And we never got to see what became of Coral. We never found out why. Why did Dworkin put the jewel in Coral's eye? I mean, I know it made her the bride of the eye or whatever. But why? And what did that do to Coral? The only time that we see Coral after she gets injured in the explosion in, the, in, in Amber and then gets the eye the, the, the stone put in there. The only time we really see and talk to her is when um, Merlin, Luke, Coral, and I want to say uh, maybe Jert, and a pattern ghost or two, when they are traveling toward the, I think toward the Courts of Chaos, right? And um, at that point, Coral's unconscious for a lot of it. And then when she wakes up, she's not really, she's kind of out of it. And the only other time we see her say or do anything is when the Logris appears, or is it the pattern? They both, the Logris and the pattern, by about the midpoint of this last book, the Logris and the pattern become almost indistinguishable. And that's kind of a problem too. I mean, I know that what Zelazny is saying is that they're basically two sides of the same coin. There's order and there's chaos, but really they're both just malevolent entities that manifest that way. You know, they're the, the unicorn and the serpent, or they're the pattern and the logris or whatever, but, or the signs, you know, but um, they really become indistinguishable. And so one of them I guess it, you know what, I think it's the pattern when, they, when they're at the primal pattern. And they, they go back to the primal pattern because that's when Merlin cuts his hand and is threatening the pattern, right, with blood in his hand that it could damage the pattern and hurt him. At that point, the pattern is trying to convince them to leave Coral behind, and she doesn't want to stay. And she's basically telling Merlin, no, no, get me out of here. And he does, and that's the last we see of her. So what was up with the jewel of judgment being in her eye? We don't know. Is she going to stay with Luke, whom she's married to, or is she going to be like get a divorce from him or an annulment and marry Cor uh, marry Merlin? Will Merlin go on and be the king of the courts? What will Random think? What will what will Corwin think? You know, now that Corwin is finally freed, uh, how was Corwin never able to find a way out of the, <laughs> out of chaos the way he did out of Amber that time when he was captured? Ah. anyway, so um, all right. So last few thoughts. 
Um, I know there's lots of other stuff here, but when I do these shows solo, I don't have anybody to help trigger my thoughts and memories and make me think of other things to say. So um, I'm going to run through them really quickly now. Uh, Trumps of Doom. Um, I love the stuff on Earth. I love the smart alecky stuff. Oh, oh, that's one thing I was going to say. Zelazny, to the very end, still is able to do the good smart alecky dialogue stuff. And I think my favorite moment in the last book, in uh, Prince of Chaos, my favorite moment is when um, the pattern, when they're at the primal pattern, and the pattern thinks it's got them dead to rights. They're not going to get away. And um, and Merlin suddenly has his cut hand out over the pattern, threatening it. You know, you better you better back off and let us go, or I might accidentally spill some blood on you. And the pattern goes from "You will do as I say," you know, blah blah, to "Would you like some cushions?" <laughs> and then they start asking for stuff like, you know, I love a nice glass of iced tea. Poof, the pattern makes a glass of iced tea appear sitting there next to him. Um, and then there's that other great moment where Luke is doing that, and he and he's talking. You just hear the audio, basically, of Luke talking with Merlin over the Trump, and Luke has got his bloody hand out over the pattern, and then he's like, oh, beep, I spilled it, and then it cuts off. So, I, you know, you got to wonder, what did the pattern think about that, and did it punish him? I don't know. I think we barely see Luke again before the story is over from that point. So we don't know. Other than in the short stories. Got to go back and read the short stories next, I guess. Okay, so Trumps of Doom, some really cool stuff early on with the uh, every April. Let's see, it's the very first line. Yeah, April 30th. It's a pain in the ass waiting around for someone to try to kill you. But it was April 30th. Of course, it would happen as it always did. Um which I guess was the anniversary of when, why didn't that figure that out, of when um, Brand was killed by Kane at the pattern fall, at the pit. Um, oh, and again, th see, these are, looking at the books is making me think of things I wanted to say. Uh, I like the pattern ghosts. I like the idea that the pattern records you as, it's, as you're walking it. And so... Um, it can create duplicates. By the way, that also reminded me there's a duplicate of the pattern, right? I like that a lot of this series was about the second pattern that Corwin created because at the end of, the, at the end of uh, Courts of Chaos, Corwin is not certain that Oberon has been able to repair the original pattern and that the universe might end. And so just to be better safe than sorry, Corwin creates his own separate pattern. And um, what that does, of course, is it tips the balance toward order and away from chaos. I only wish that Zelazny had made more of this series about that, but he really doesn't bring that in in a big way until like book three, maybe. So, um, so I like the pattern ghosts, but we never really find out what happens to, to Corwin's pattern. They should send the... They should send the pat the Corwin ghost back to the Corwin pattern to be there, since the regular Corwin presumably will be staying in the regular pattern universe, Amber universe, something like that. Anyway, I like the pattern ghost. The pattern ghost lets you bring back characters that are dead, and that's a great thing because there's so many great characters that are dead. So there's that one scene in the in the last book where, or next to last, or I think it's next to last or last book, I think it's the last book, where yeah, it's the last book, where we see Eric, Gerard, and Kane, I want to say. Maybe there's another one, but definitely Eric, Gerard, and Kane. And Gerard is wrestling with one of the Chaos Lords and having a wrestling match. And that was so cool. I'm, I'm pretty sure Gerard is still alive, but it was so cool to see Eric again and to see Kane again. And, and this gives you a way to do that. It's too bad that so much of it was a Corwin ghost when Corwin was still alive. We needed, you know, we needed to see, I wanted a Deirdre ghost. That's who I was really hoping we would see. I was hoping that like the, that, that the pattern might produce a Deirdre ghost and the Deirdre ghost could run into the Corwin ghost and they could go off together and, and have a lovely conversation or whatever, uh, knowing Corwin and, and Deirdre. 
And uh, he'd get to see her again, right? Because that was the thing that broke his heart more than anything else in the first few books is losing Deirdre. So anyway, um, so I like the first one a lot. Um, Blood of Amber is good too, and it's still that same sort of storyline with Luke and everything. But like I say, these last three is where it sort of loses its way and becomes politics. It becomes lots of conversations. Um, the one thing I will give them is that, especially in the first two or three books, you do see a lot of Amber. You see a lot of stuff that you didn't really see in the first five books because Corwin was rarely in a situation in the first five books where he could just stroll down the street and go to a fish and chips place, right? Or go to a vineyard. You see a lot of that in these books because Merlin is not in the straits that Corwin was in. So Merlin is able to spend some time casually walking around, going to restaurants, talking about the wine, talking about the, the you know, death alley and all that. That's good because you get to see those things, but it's not good in the sense that that means the plot, the, the momentum has completely vanished. When we're, when we're having long chapters of Merlin eating dinner and commenting on the fish and chips and the wine, that's a sign that you seriously lost your narrative momentum and you're just sort of circling around, right? So um, these are much more leisurely books for the most part. There's no great massive impetus to go blast your way through them other than, oh, it's more amber. And at that point, I'm kind of repeating myself. So I think I'll wrap up here. I'm just going to say... The, the good thing I'll say about these books, it's more Zelazny, it's more Amber. You see a lot more of Amber. You see a lot more of the Courts of Chaos. You know, I think, I think that the Corwin cycle, a lot of it is on Earth or in Shadow Worlds where like Blaze and, and he and Blaze are attacking the, you know, whatever. You don't see nearly as much of Amber and of the Courts of Chaos in the Corwin books because they're much more about Corwin doing stuff and go, go, go. Or off in shadow, you know, in his hell rides. These books are much more leisurely. You get to see places you don't see. You get to dwell. You get to kind of leisurely take your time going through these various places, encountering characters you know that you haven't seen in a while since the first few books. That's the good thing, and and, and that's nice. And Merlin is a fun character. I like him a lot. I like him a lot more than a lot of people do. But again, I think that the bad side of these books is they don't have nearly the, the propulsion, the propulsive force that the Corin books do. They meander. They're very slow. As I said before, they have about 20 different small plots and not really one big plot. Um, and so it's just much more difficult to get through them. You can't put the Corin books down, and it's hard to keep the momentum to get through all of these. So... I'll give them an A or an A minus rather than a, and parts of them get like a B. Whereas all the Corwin stuff is pretty much A plus. Um, oh yeah. And one other thing about the writing of them, I really do get the sense that, that, that uh, Zelazny made all the, all the, uh, the Amber books up as he went along. I always got the sense that he, he might've had a general idea where he was going, but these do not read these do not read as books where he had a plan, you know. These do not read as books where he knew exactly where he was going and he's following the map. These these very much read like um, he's sort of making it up as he goes along. And in some ways that's good because it allows for spontaneity and allows you to go off in different directions. Stephen King is very good at that. But in some ways it's bad because it meant that he really didn't ever... He had a hard time settling on what the stories were about. So, all right. So that's my little take on the Merlin cycle of the Chronicles of Amber. I would love to hear your feedback in the various locations, either where I post this, on Facebook, on Twitter, or, um, or um, uh, in the comments section on the Podbean page. Well, while I'm talking about this, and bear with me for just a second, because I got to do the patrons. Um, let me find where I keep those. Ah, here it is. Here is our patron list. Shows like this are able to happen because of people like you who have joined up and give as little as a dollar a month to keep our shows on the air, and we really appreciate that. Uh, all you got to do is go to www.plexico.net, P-L-E-X-I-C-O, plexico.net, uh, and, and click on the, the patron link there. 
or just go to patreon.com and look up Van Plexico, Van Allen Plexico, and it'll take you right to it. It lets you hook, be part of the White Rocket family and uh, help pay our bills to do all of our various shows. Uh, we don't really have sponsors. We have our listeners who keep us on the air. Our current patrons who keep us going. And by the way, if you go there, you'll see you get quite a few perks as being for being a member every month. Um, our current patrons as of this recording in January of 2019 are Brendan O'Dwyer, Samuel Salvatore, Christopher Burleson, Carl Von Drunker, Phil Amthor, Willie Carden, Susan Trawick, Ben Spooner, Stephen Thompson, Chris Usher, Justin Bean, Steve Trawick, Richard Stevens, Johnny Caldwell, Reynolds Wolf, Joshua Corbett, Valiant Hermes, Jacob and Robin Fleming, Clay Henson, Ann Kangian, Catherine England, George Gaston, Will Summerford, John McCune, Tom Anderson, Dave Evers, Andrew Barber, Timothy, Steve Harlan, Dan Thompson, Wes Atkinson, Rich Reimer, Jared Albrecht, William Glenn Matthews, Joel Beckham, I'm almost done, Joel, uh, Joel Beckham, uh, Theodore Gary, Shannon Butson, Taylor, David Hegler, Mickey B, Hugh Anderson, Shane Bailey, Mick Vigicana, Chris Thrash, Logan Chilton, Tony Perry, Alex Wynn, Josh Teal, David Simpson, Earl Ricks, Mike Finley, C.T. Wayne, Dave Powell, Donnie Reynolds, Wade Carson, Ivor Evans, John Zavachin, Chris Camo, Darren Pyle, Chris Wardam Wade, Jason Albrick, Randall Walker, Ben Amos, I promise I'm nearly done, Ruth and Darren Sutherland, Patrick Williams, Rob Morgan, Stephen Schuster, James Taylor, John Stubbs, Kent Brent Rains, Nicholas Craig, Russell Milling, Matthew Wagstaff, Joey Miller, Mark Squire, Spanky, Brant Rumble, J.W. Rice, Michael Morton, Lawrence Kane, and our one-time and anonymous donors. We thank you all so much. Again, go to www.plexico.net or go to www.patreon.com. Um, we, we appreciate it. And there was one other thing I wanted to say, but I don't know what it was. So um, you can scroll back a bit through the on the Podbean page on whiterocket.podbean.com, and you can find our earlier episodes uh, where guests and I talked about the... Um, the early, the original five. We did, I think, three separate shows talking about the first five books. They're back before episode 100, but I can't remember how far back. So you have to scroll back until you see the Chronicles of Amber, Zelazny's Amber. There's also, like I said, a number of episodes that talk about where I recorded convention panels at Dragon Con, at Archon, and other conventions talking about Zelazny and Amber over the last few years. So enjoy. And the rocket's going to get out of here for another episode, and we will see you guys down the road.